thank you for showing up, or at least checking your email in this room. Um, yeah, sure. Um, okay. So, who in this room has said this before? Yeah, I know a couple of those up there. Um, So oh, who also has a AWS bill? Oh, well, has I said this about this AWS bill in the cloud here? Um, I definitely have, and I've also said the first thing. Um, followed by, I have no, no idea where that seventeen dollars comes from. It's been there since forever. Followed by the magic words, meh. Of course, there's going to be a lot of people in this room, I know. Um, and that's because we never told anybody, well, not in these modern times, is trust but verify. Right? Can we actually, do we understand what's running in our infrastructure, our little cloud? Um, trust but verify is, is a principle we'll tell most of our, uh, our developers, uh, you know, uh, filter inputs, escape output, or the other way around, I'm never sure. Um, but we should um, also in the infrastructure space, we should make sure that what we build is actually, we know what, what's running at any given time. If only that we um, know where our possible attack factors are. Because when I, if I were a hacker, I wouldn't try and hack the front, inter the front uh, facing interface for a bank or, or Netflix or wherever, I would try and find those you know, scratched um, one-time VMs, password, hello world, um, for companies that basically have no network segregation. So that's the, the, the unpatched node um, that we're looking for. And that's more common than you, you think. Uh, um, and to understand why, we need to understand the, the how or the reverse. Um, back in the days when ITIL was strong, uh, we used to have something called a CMDB, a configuration management database. It's completely different from what we think it is. Um, back in those days, um, we believed that any, if you turn something into an Excel sheet, we would live happy lives and the yin and yang would be in balance. Um, of course, they weren't. They never were. Um, because as engineers, we had many, many, many reasons not to do stuff. One, because we're lazy. Most of these CMDBs are incredibly complex to, uh, to understand, let alone administrate. Um, a node's called a CI or a com configuration uh, yeah. unit thing. Yeah. Um, Okay, uh, I'll continue while they restart the stream. Um, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so back in the days of grumpy, yeah, grumpy um, engineers in basements that run uh, server farms, um, they were told everything needed to be in the CMDB, that life wouldn't change whether or not the CMDB was up to date. It took a long time to actually do it. Um, I've worked at, as a consultant in places where it took dedicated staff to understand how to update the CMDB, with the result being that nodes that were correctly identified as a production system took um, an extra step to get root access or pseudo powers for when an incident was happening. So the, game of, the aim of the game was to keep a system on a staging um, identifier for as long as possible. Because then we wouldn't have to call the knock in the middle of the night and explain to someone that wasn't an, S um, an SME on my systems why I would have to have access to my systems. Um, so the result was gamification and make sure that the system is not registered correctly. Um, those systems were, well, those were in the days before APIs, before automation. So there was also very manual 
um, to update. And that's, you know, we're all lazy probably, or we should be lazy, that's why we, we automate things. So when they, you couldn't automate it, you basically ignored it for the whole year. You did, you took inventory for one day, made sure you made the correct mistakes and then ignored it for an entire year. And that sort of made us as an industry allergic to, to seeing DBs, right? They had no purpose or they were, uh, they were wrong on purpose. Um, and those are the people now that uh, the, gray, the gray bearded grumpy guys that basically say don't, don't do it. There's no reason. So there's an entire new generation that has no idea that there is some benefit to registering your systems correctly. Uh, if only for, for cost. So before I completely uh, lose you, let's pretend we're some data science and we're going to do some data science on our, uh, on our infrastructure. So a data science pipeline usually contains the three steps. It's extract, so we're going to look for where the data might be that we're interested in. We're going to transform it a little bit and then we're going to load it or store it so we can actually review it for later time. Um, like these systems don't need, to, don't need to be complex. Here's on screen, there's a couple of ways to actually find out from your, let's call it Pulumi, of, uh, open uh, tofu code. Um, um, I'll I'll still need to replace that one. Like he can actually directly ask your your Terraform code, your Terraform state, like how many things should be there. Uh, simple JQ query um, or in Bash, as the the previous speaker was a big fan of. Like Bash is all you need for most of the stuff. Set grab grab uh, did a bit of all. Um, you you can find the amount of compute resources that you that are currently modeled in your code. And you, and you can go to your, the bill of your, your cloud provider and go, is, I find 90 nodes in my Terraform code, are there 90 nodes on the bill? There probably aren't. Um, so that's your first clue. Um, when yeah, the people that raise their hands on like how many nodes, are, is, if it isn't in code, it's not, it doesn't exist. Um, most config management systems like, for instance, Puppet, where you can see here on the screen, is th there's a sort of an inventory service that will have a list of things that have been registered to Puppet. Um, in this case, there'll be a hundred production servers that I have um, since this morning. So those are, I know they're, they're in my system, there are a hundred nodes that are correctly configured or hopefully correctly configured, but at least they, they call into Puppet every half hour and ask what the correct configuration is. Um, so that's my benchmark. I have 100 systems that are up to date that are correctly registered, um, and now I need to find the, the outliers. Um, systems need to be um, registered in a couple of systems. Right? One's, one's your config management, the other one is your monitoring system, because um, you need to be able to find it. In this case, I'm just looking up, um, give me the sum of all the nodes that uh, have a node exporter registered. This is in our case, it's one of the earliest things we installed. That's one of the most basic metrics, um, well, exporters that we'll have on the system. So it's going to be everywhere. Every system, or one of my systems, will always going to have a node exporter. Um, so, for the people that haven't fallen asleep yet, 103 in Prometheus, 100 in Puppet. Um, so, I, I should really come to this talk. Um, yeah, so I know, so now we all know what I'll be doing tomorrow. It's finding or hunting down those three nodes that do produce metrics somehow, but it wasn't. Um, registered correctly. Uh, the other one I, I came across the other week, I have roughly 100 nodes. There's another 60 in my staging environment. I had 1,900 DNS entries in our system. Um, that was a big eye-opener. That was very scary. We had similar numbers in our IPAM system, so our, our IP registration system. 
So now I had to account for 1,700, so roughly more than 95% of my DNS entries, my IP entries, um, were not in active use, maybe. So our CISO definitely had kittens that day when we told them. Um, since DNS is one of those systems you need to be registered in to do things, I mean, you can't get around it, but that's usually what people do. They'll have a vanity URL and go, this is how we're going to reach my system. So DNS, IPAM, that's definitely something you're going to want to look at. Um, one that also found interesting is have a look at your Jenkins, your GitHub Actions, and count the, the, the nodes you're actually deploying to. Um, I have seen entire cube clusters that nobody knew about, but they were available in CI. Also, um, you're going to have a look at oh, your vendor billing changes. That there, some of them are better than others. This is an example of AWS. They had a very, very good cost explorer, and then you, you can pretty much compare any variable you come up with against any other variables. Um, the one with AWS is most of the time they have many, many regions and you're probably only going to deploy into one or two, three, a handful, a known list of, of, of regions. And I've been at one customer where they had $2,000 worth of costs in a region that they definitely weren't using. Um, and even then the answer was meh. You know, our bill is whatever it was, I think north of 60k, um, so the 2k we don't particularly care about. And that was a, um, a financial institution that was controlled by uh, um, quite a bit of legislation. Um, the other one I'm going to mentioned here is the lack of signal is definitely a signal. So keep an eye out on team reports um, or even um, news flashes that get sent around. It's like, this new cool system X is just being launched and you don't see your cost go up. So that basically means someone's having a skunk, uh, skunk works project somewhere in the, in the um, in the cupboard, signal is spelled. No? Signal, yeah, sign, second signal is so, um, Yeah, so the lack of signal is definitely a signal. So keep your ear out, do some um, social engineering, um, and keep track of what projects are currently running and whether you believe that should increase the infra costs. And if it doesn't, then something is definitely up. Um, which means then, well, it potentially there's unprotected system somewhere in your, your um, that will have access to things they shouldn't have. Uh, I know here at Config Management Man Camp this might be a uh, uh, controversial statement. You're going to be big friends with the UIs that vendors provide, the suppliers provide their billing pages um, in case our, of our um, DNS provider an external DNS provider. Um, when I logged in, it was clearly to, it was clearly shown that you have 1,900 or 1,800 uh, DNS entries. If I if I had logged in at that website earlier, I would have seen that, uh, but I didn't because I terraform everything because I'm lazy. But you sh um, sometimes you just need to log into these things, and some of the 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 metrics, the signals you're looking for is actually very clearly shown on these websites. So I can, I can highly recommend just having a look and see whether, what is available to you. Because um, there you can also start doing comparisons, SKUs, uh, which is types of, of machines. Um, so the SKUs that are applied, like um, I think we, like our Terraform code, Make, we in, in our Terraform code, we make sure we only use a certain type of a, a AWS machine. And on my bill, there's three different types. That's also a signal that someone is uh, actually spending money or doing things they shouldn't. And as I mentioned, the, the cloud regions 
in AWS being the biggest offender. Um, I know I only have three regions defined in my, my Terraform files, and there are seven on the bill. So definitely those four other regions are, are now suspecting something. We'll need to deal with it. Um, the metric system, that's the other one. Um, you can ask most, well, all modern uh, observability tools that I know of actually have metrics about themselves. So they all can actually tell you, you have 500,000 um, metric series in your system. Yesterday there were 400,000, so something showed up yesterday that is now producing 100,000 data series. Data series, um, if you use a SaaS product, 100, well, in my case, 400 to 500 means my cloud, well, my, my in this case, Grafana cloud bill is going to go up 20%. Um, that's painful if we hadn't budgeted for it. It might also be an actual signal that there are systems that's producing something um, that shouldn't be there. In this case, I know it's new nodes that I deployed. I've seen these peaks before, and there was someone turning production, um, the debug mode on for the production, and then going to bed. Meaning that they produced, uh, sorry, the maths escaped me, but when I turned it off, basically we had 1% of the data stream left. So they produced 99% uh, overhead on their, uh, their stream for a weekend. Because they, of course, they went to bed on a Friday night, as you do, and come back. Uh, and when I showed up on Monday morning European time, um, I had a huge peak um, that scared quite a few people. And then, of course, is the question: How crazy should I go uh, automating this? Because we're all engineers, so it's all kind of data that we need to collect. Um, you probably don't have to, to start, you know, the, the try and work out a system where you um, peel off the highest value layer. So most of the time you can just simply start with the, the, the bash examples I showed. How, how many nodes uh, should there be? How many nodes are on the bill? Boom. Automation done. Um, I've seen people go completely crazy where they start scraping APIs. Um, once APIs aren't available, you know, we'll mock something that clicks buttons for us. Um, no, that's probably not what you need. Because um, it also needs to be in relationship actually to the $17. Um, if you're really looking for cost, then $17 is, you know, a couple of minutes you'll have to spend on it. If you uh, ask the CISO, it's going to give you a couple more hours to make sure it's actually what's the delta is actually safe. Um, there's also tools that can actually help you and basically turn everything into a SQL, uh, SQL statement. Um, here's an example of something called Cloud Query. Um, what they actually do, they wrap the cloud vendor APIs into uh, something that looks like SQL that you can um, then turn into uh, a simple SQL statement that you can use in, in, in small uh, code scripts, things that um, that got turned into something that a human actually wants to read. Um, maybe an Excel sheet, because that's what CISO is, in my experience, CISO seems to like. Um, but it could be as simple as just your, your, your favorite SQL editor is going to show you a table. And then we can compare it to other tables uh, with simple bash tools. Um, but how about we're going to keep up with, with live, you know, uh, we're all cloud native, so things that I run the script are probably changing underneath me. Um, so how are we going to actually fix this? Um, so I've mostly been focusing on people doing naughty stuff. Um, um, so if you want them to not do naughty stuff anymore, trying to work around the systems you have, is make it as simple as possible um, for them to do the right thing. Um, one is actually at AWS, the example I've been hitting a lot today, is you can actually have a company policy, company-wide policy that says you're only ever allowed to, to deploy to you EU Central 1, which I believe is Frankfurt, and then we'll add a, an organizational policy basically saying that's the, the one region you can go into. 
um, if there are still regions that have uh, resources, don't apply this yet, because then you're not allowed to clean them up anymore. Um, or have another policy where you as an info team actually have these powers still. Um, that's probably, and then basically tag the shit out of everything, if it's possible with your, your vendor. Um, you know, the three-year-old at home draws on the wall, and that's basically what you need to do. Uh, you allow everybody to draw on the walls, tag their name on it, so you can actually find out every resource that doesn't have this tag is basically suspect. I mean, there's going to be people going to try and, and game, gamify this setup, but it's one of those things. So, in um, oh, open to a you can actually set something called the default tags. Um, so, we're going to, everything that we're going to build is going to have the following tags, um, and everything we're going to have alerting somehow of that. If these tags are not present, you know, you're naughty, you're costing the company money, you're probably doing it off budget and unsafe. If you look at back at your metric systems, you can actually force labels on things as well. Um, looking at Prometheus, is, you'll have a, a, key, a key value pair called external labels and we can actually add these labels on it. Um, this can also be gamified, but if you look at the example, we're actually reading the, uh, the, the variables, the labels we want to set directly out of our, our Puppet certificate. For those people that don't know, um, don't know Puppet, Puppet has a uh, server-client relationship that is secured by a certificate, which you're allowed to sign additional key value pairs into. And that's why I always do. Like the environment, production is always signed into the certificate, and that's the only one that I trust. Because uh, Puppet has the notion of facts, but facts are user uh, mutatable, and the only thing that isn't mutatable if it's if it's signed into the certificate. Another way for people to uh, uh, try to get around this is change this value, um, which I'm no longer allowing. Um, yeah, so this is the cop out about containers. Containers are, and um, especially systems in high flux. Uh, supposedly, that's what people mean when they say cloud native. Um, alert on things that cost you money. I've been at places where they were. They said, "Oh, work. We just switched to a serverless framework. It's going to save us tons of money versus running containers on ourselves." Um, what you need to know for um, functionless things is you pay per, per clock cycle, basically. Um, they have a, in, in Amazon, for the longest of time, they had a five minute limit on things that run fast. And it automatically, it automatically would kill these things at the five minute point. This particular customer, their super fast function as functions ran four minutes 52, making it their system, their fun, their the temporary functions basically run 24-7 um, compared to if they run it on a VM, it would have cost them 5,000% less. They didn't work that out until the first bill hit, which was huge. Um, like, well, how did it happen? How did we, uh, why did we not get notified? Because the average runtime was just below the five minutes. So they absolutely used everything that you could find in the system. Um, and this is sort of the, uh, the painful truth at the end for people that have been ignoring CMDBs. Um, please use a CMDB, especially for more static things. Uh, it's going to make life a lot easier where you can just query um, your system like a known system instead of having to cobble together the information. I'm going to introduce something called Netbox, um, which is, um, uh, well, they don't call themselves a CMDB, they call them the source of truth. Um, and why I'm introducing it? Because you can also terraform it. Or, um, so in this case, it's going to, what I'm showing here is a three-step process. One, I'm going to register um, an IP prefix or a CIDR. I'm going to read it out of Netbox again. And then I'm just going to ask Netbox, give me the first available IP in this range. 
registered for it, and then register for it, me for a uh, registered for me with the following DNS name. I mean, this is how easy you can get with a system like um, with Terraform. Because it is Terraform, when you clean the node or destroy the node, all of this stuff goes away at the same time. So your, your, your accounting actually adds up in, in both columns now. Yeah, that doesn't sound very easy. Of course, in the, uh, this ecosystem, we'll just have a module. So in our case, what we always do, we have a module that wraps a certain amount of steps. In this case, I'm, I'm going to create a, uh, a server at supplier X, um, where you're going to inject a certain amount of information they want to know, you know, cloud in, uh, variables, scripts. And then I'm just going to register it. Um, and that's how you wrap it and just tell everybody this is the module you need to have in your, uh, um, in your code. And in our case, we just wrap this again in a, in a create node, um, or a supplier specific create node module, and then everything is taken care of um, for people that um, do their own, so relatively own uh, infrastructure. So we basically wrap this for them, um, making our ad admin a lot more accurate. That's the end. Any questions? Uh, how can you handle like, uh, like in cloud we use uh, auto scaling systems? Yes. Is that like uh, obs not obscure, but uh, make the metrics a bit harder to monitor based on the metrics because this, there may be skew, you know, from static resources combined with like auto scaling stuff. Yes. Um, so the question is, how do we take auto scaling into account? That actually is the harder question. That's the same, actually, the same one as um, uh, the Docker, the Docker stuff. So, it's, what do I do with volatile things, be, albeit machines and auto scaling setups or, or containers? And it is um, the answer is roughly similar. Make sure that you know. Uh, you set same defaults on the module that wraps the auto scaling settings. So have a, 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 an upper limit that's not going to break the bank over the weekend. Um, and you can also, most, most auto scaling systems will emit some, some kind of metrics. So you, instead of looking at the metrics directly, you'll look at the rise value. What is the rate of scale or what is the, the surface below the curve for the people that did statistics. Um, so you start looking at derived metrics like those um, and be really careful because auto scaling is one of these things that is going to bankrupt you if you don't, don't accurately look at it. Um, yeah, so the, the question is how do I deal with, with yeah, resources that don't, I can't particularly uh, terraform but are happen to be API calls to whatever cloud provider API we have and that's, um, that's, uh, that's, that one is harder and really dependent on, on, on the provider. What I've done before is basically try and set up a, a sort of a proxy and start counting there if that is an option in, in the system. Um, and that's, that's how you do the, the double accounting. Like every, everybody needs to have a certain header and everybody, everything that doesn't have a header that will hopefully will get you closer to where it's coming from. It's either a proxy before or, or after. And that's it.